This weekend, two thirds of motorsports Triple Crown will happen on the same day, the Monaco Grand Prix and the Indianapolis 500. Two historic races that are full of history and tradition, scheduled on the same day, because, well, reasons. It's probably a carryover of one of Mr. Eccleston's big brain moments to stop F1 drivers from pulling double duty. Same way, there's usually an F1 Grand Prix on the same day as the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which is the third part of the Triple Crown. Except, of course, 2015 when Nico Hülkenberg found a hole in the calendar and exploited it. But either way, Monaco and Indy are two historic races that have a lot of tradition associated with them. They're staples of the motorsport calendar and Monaco, Indy and by extension Le Mans are three separate races that are the pinnacle or at least the most famous of the main three forms of racing. Circuit racing, oval racing and endurance racing. The Indy 500 is also one of the world's oldest races, being held first in 1911 and being held almost every year towards the end of May. Exceptions being for the two world wars and 2020 when it was held in August due to the, um, well, the global situation we'll call it. Am I actually allowed to use the proper name now or has YouTube still been picky about that? But out of those three races, the Indy 500 is seen as being a bit of an ugly duckling among some. Monaco, you're millimetres away from the walls at any given point. Le Mans, it's a 24 hour marathon, but IndyCar, yeah, that's the one that's frowned upon. So I'm here to tell you why the Indy 500 is more important, more difficult and more prestigious than Formula 1 fans will want to believe it is. There's this thing among F1 fans that anything that isn't Formula 1 is below them and not worth their time. You see it with some of these F1 content creators sobbing that it's not race week or raw keek to run that meme into the ground, yet won't give any other series that is racing that weekend the time of day. Because it's not F1. Indy qualifying was on at the weekend, there was the Nürburgring 24 at the weekend, and also the BTCC from Snetterton. They probably weren't watched by some of these people. But the Indy 500 is a race that you should have on your radar for a few simple reasons that can be expanded upon thusly. Firstly, it's a 200 mile an hour dogfight. Well, I say 200 miles an hour, these guys will be hitting upwards of 240 miles an hour at the end of the two long straights before lobbing it into turns one and three, with dirty air and other cars around them trying to defend, make an overtake and other bits and pieces like that. In 2018, after one of the restarts, Alex Rossi went round the outside of something like four cars through turns one and two on the dirty part of the track. High risk, high reward, and high speed. If at any point something went wrong, he's in a wall, and it's race over. In the Fast 12 this weekend, Alex Palau was the fastest man ever in an Indy 500 qualifying session, setting an average speed of 234.217 miles an hour over the four time laps. And I'm going to be using mostly miles and feet and inches because Murica and also, well, I'm British, we use miles anyway, and I can't do the maths. But either way, Alex beat the man in second place, Renus VK, by just 0.006 miles an hour, which equates to milliseconds over a 38-ish second lap, which is about 38 seconds, isn't it? In fact, let's dive deeper into how unhinged this statistic is, because according to the academic repository that is TikTok, someone has calculated the following. Palo completed the 10-mile run, which is four two and a half mile laps, in 153.7037 seconds. VK did that same 10 miles in 153.7077 seconds. With IndyCar being so close in terms of timing, they had to unlock a hundredth of a thousandth of a second on their clocks. Makes you wonder how they did it back before all of this existed, really. So if you were to overlay the two laps like two ghost cars on a track in Gran Turismo, Palau would cross the line 16.49 inches ahead of VK. 16.49 inches being 41.88 centimetres. The time difference between the two over a qualifying lap is faster than you can blink. Which leads me on to the next bit. It's competitive as hell. Formula One over the last 10 years has been sort of one dude and team. Vettel, then Hamilton, now for Stappen. In the Indy 500, virtually any of the 33 cars on the grid can win the race due to the way the cars are built and the way the race can go. Unlike other forms of oval racing, NASCAR, the Indy 500 is 500 miles. If it ends behind the safety car, so be it. F1 snobs will go on and on about how it's all F1 rejects and things like that. It's easy, it's just turning left, but let's check some stats here. The last winner of the Indy 500 that was once a Formula 1 driver is Marcus Ericsson. 
a man who drove a Caterham and a few Saubers in his F1 career, so probably wasn't going to set the world on fire. He won the Indy 500 at his fourth attempt. The next ex-F1 driver to win the 500 was Takuma Sato, who did it for the first time in 2017 at the eighth attempt. There's also Alex Rossi, but I've not counted him due to him not doing a full F1 season. Before Sato, the last driver to go from Formula 1 to IndyCar and win the 500 was Fittipaldi in 1989. Before Fittipaldi, it was Graham Hill in 1966 and Jim Clark in 1965. Now there's going to be people asking what about Montoya, what about Villeneuve, but I've excluded those two because they went from Indy to F1 and in Montoya's case, went back. You just have to look at the McLaren debacle of 2019, being bumped out by a team that lost all its sponsors as proof of it not being a case of just turn up and turn left. There are three XF1 drivers on the grid for this year's 500, again excluding Rossi. Those three drivers are Roman Grosjean, Takuma Sato and last year's winner Ericsson. There are other drivers who started their careers in Europe and moved over such as Santino Ferrucci, Callum Eilat and Jack Harvey but even with that said, it's not exactly the F1 graveyard it's made out to be. Will one of these ex-F1 drivers or guys that started their careers in Europe win it? Yeah, they might do. They've got more of a chance of winning the race than they ever did in Formula 1, that's for sure. So you've got 240 mile an hour cars, mechanical parts stretched to the limit, one mistake going to result in a potentially massive crash, the ultimate concentration for 500 miles while the Monaco Grand Prix is less than 200 and Le Mans has driver swaps. It all adds up to the what if, the what could be. Stories like that really. See J.R. Hildebrand wiping out on the final lap of the 2011 race to give Dan Weldon the victory. You've also got the racing legends that were created in AJ Foyt, the Andretti family, Roger Penske, Parnelli Jones, Rick Mears, the Andretti curse, and the time that these all-American racers almost got burned by Stuart Hill and Clark in 1966. Again, the what-ifs. If Clark hadn't spun, if Stuart's car had held on, it could have been a British 1-2-3 in 1966. But it wasn't. While the Formula 1 calendar has evolved and tracks have come and gone and changed layouts, there aren't many opportunities when the greats are remembered en masse at a single race. At Indy, they are. The likes of Castroneves, Foyt, Mears and even Clark and Hill have their faces carved into the massive trophy presented to the winner. As one person put it, it's like you're emptying a hall of fame out onto the track every single year. At Monaco, you will be reminded of Senna, Hill and Schumacher who have the most wins there, but at Indy, it's all of them. Every last one of them since 1911. Remember, this is the highest attended event, so people actually turning up to go and watch, in the world. Silverstone on race day, 150,000 people through the door. World Cup final, it's however big the stadium is. Same for the Olympics on a 100 meter final day. This is not just smooth brains who like simple things. This is a culmination of longevity, history, risk and reward, and the stories that have been written over the last 112 years. But another thing I've read while putting this together is that Indianapolis still has that same feel to it. A feel that you probably wouldn't get if it was held anywhere else in the US. California hates cars now, Florida and the other southern states became NASCAR country. There's just something about that particular part of the world that makes it what it is. It's got that small farming town vibe to it, a vibe that you wouldn't get in New York, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, Dallas, wherever. It's like those small town dirt oval venues where everybody says hello, a lot of people recognize each other, they might know each other, and everybody's just there to enjoy some good hard racing. It's that on a much bigger scale. It's so hard to explain. It's a city that opens its arms to a quarter of a million people, so the population of Southampton every year, and puts a lot of respect on a race that is nearly 40 years older than the Formula One World Championship and a decade older than 24 hours of Le Mans. And that's the same respect that the F1 snob should give it too. So, some opinions on why the Indy 500 is more than just turning left and why it's worth your time. If you have other bits to add, do leave them in the designated comment submission zone under this video and get a discussion going. And while scrolling down, like and subscribe and all that YouTube stuff so we can feed that algorithm. And also a massive thanks to the people of Patreon for their continued support. If you want to help out with stuff around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description along with other associated links, so Discord, socials, that sort of thing. And there's super thanks down there too if you just want to do a one-off tip. I've had quite a few of those lately, so once again, a massive thank you. 
So until next time, I've been Adam Award. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.